Hello, everybody. Uh, this is a criminal procedure topic, judicial monitoring of selective discriminatory prosecution. Uh, the topic links up to Chapter 3, Part B5 of the Miller and Wright text. Here we go. Claims about selective prosecution are a common way of talking about criminal justice and a common allegation about possible unfairness in the system. It's cocktail party talk, and it's press conference talk, and it speaks to an important norm of equal treatment. Prosecutors take this seriously. They try to structure their work in ways that create some assurance that they're making reasoned decisions. If we've got different outcomes in the system, they say, it needs to be based on some kind of defensible, publicly, uh, regar public regarding reasons. Now what we're focusing on here is a, a little subset, one little corner of this larger world of talk about selective prosecution. In particular, we're talking about the handful of cases where judges have declared that they're willing to inquire into and possibly remedy unequal charging decisions by prosecutors. So you see all the time judges saying, we're not going to get involved in charging questions. That's an executive function, not a judicial function. But they normally do mention one exception. They say, if the prosecutor is discriminating on the basis of equal protection suspect classes, they're bringing charges against one racial group and not against another, or they're bringing charges because of somebody's exercise of constitutional rights and not because of, uh, not because of the underlying crime. In those settings, the courts say, uh, we will, or at least we might, step in and invalidate the, uh, the prosecution as a remedy for this uh, discriminatory, constitutionally discriminatory prosecution. The, uh, the key modern case here is United States versus Armstrong. Once you read it, you realize why there's not a very extensive line of cases on this topic. A new one pops up, but only every 50 years or so. Uh, pictured here is the, uh, the federal courthouse in uh, Los Angeles where this, uh, where this litigation originated. It's the, uh, the Spring Street Courthouse. Uh, and in this federal trial court, Armstrong was indicted in 1992 for conspiracy to distribute more than 50 grams of crack cocaine and a firearms violation. And so the defense filed a motion and said, we believe that the prosecution brings these cases more often involving black defendants than other uh, defendants. And they had three different forms of proof not to establish the claim, but three different forms of proof to try to convince the judge to order discovery. So the first uh, form of proof uh, that the uh, defendant brought in was a, an affidavit from a paralegal in the Federal Public Defender's Office. Uh, and that affidavit said, you know, I looked back at last year's crack cocaine cases and all 24 cases in our files from last year involved black uh, defendants. Proof form number one. The second form of proof that the defendant brought in trying to obtain discovery and access to further more detailed uh, evidence came in from a, a drug counselor who says, I talk to people who are using uh, crack cocaine and it's my impression that blacks and whites are equally likely to use uh, crack and therefore the pool of potential defendants ought not to be very much racially skewed. And then finally the third form of proof uh, came from an affidavit from a private defense lawyer who says, well if you go over to state court and you look around, you will see some white defendants over there in state court where the punishments are less. It's only here in federal court where the punishments are higher that we see uh, exclusively uh, black defendants. The government opposed this motion, of course, and they had their own affidavits. So they submit first an affidavit saying, first of all, look, we deny that race was a basis for our decisions. Uh, also noting that if you look at the case that we have filed here against Armstrong, very strong evidence of guilt here. 
And they point to a 1989 DEA report that said that there is differential drug activities among different, uh, among different racial groups. So if you look at Jamaican, Haitian, and black street gangs, they're dealing in different drugs, different patterns of distribution. So if the underlying reality has some uh, racial dif uh, disparity involved in it, then it wouldn't be that surprising that our charging decisions also have some racial disparity uh, involved in it. But, uh, but we didn't choose Armstrong because of his race. Uh, the district judge here, uh, Judge Consuelo Marshall, uh, ordered discovery uh, and told the government to list all of its cases from the last three years charging both cocaine and firearms uh, charges, uh, to list the race of the defendants in those cases, the types of investig investigations used, uh, and some ex explanation for its charging criteria. Ninth Circuit also agreed with uh, some discovery in this setting, but then it comes to the Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, pictured here in his glorious uh, robes with the uh, stripes on the sleeves, inspired, it is said, by uh, a Gilbert and Sullivan play, Iolanthe, the custom of the Lord Chancellor had these four nifty stripes, and so Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, uh, adopted that from that point forward. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion uh, in this case holds that it's that the uh, defendant did not uh, present enough to justify a discovery order here. Uh, for discovery, the court says you need, quote, some evidence of discriminatory effect and intent. And on that effect prong, the discriminatory effect prong, you've got to show some kind of proof of the government's failure to charge uh, in comparable cases that involved non-black defendants. So if you can find a similarly situated non-black defendant who was not charged, that could be some evidence of discriminatory effect. But the court says you didn't have that here. Now, what were the court's reasons for setting up this as the standard to, that defendants have to meet to get discovery? Well, first of all, the court notes these discovery orders are going to be burdensome on government. It's going to take some time to go back and reconstruct what the reasons were for declining prosecution in, uh, in all of the cases that the court ordered uh, here. Uh, and it might disclose prosecution strategy. There's some risk of leaking law enforcement information. Um, the court also says strong proof of intent is going to be required to ultimately prove the claim, so discovery itself should also be uh, difficult uh, just because of this compliance has many of the same effects as responding to a, a prima facie case. Uh, and then finally, the court stressed that judges should get involved in essentially executive decisions only with great reluctance. Uh, and so only when you've got a real head start on the preliminary proof should a judge jump in and uh, uh, order some kind of discovery in these delicate uh, areas. And as for applying the standard in this case, uh, what was missing? What, why did the, uh, the defendant not have some evidence of discriminatory effect given the three affidavits? Well, first of all, the paralegal study didn't identify any non-blacks who were not charged. And then as for the drug counselor and private defense attorney affidavits, the court said they're hearsay and they report personal conclusions that are based on anecdotal evidence. So you need something a little bit more systematic. You need to tell us the basis for your conclusion rather than just saying, I'm a drug counselor. I see a lot of these. Trust me, they're equal black and white. So too much uh, uh, reliance on personal conclusions and anecdotal evidence. Now let's compare Christopher Armstrong's claim to some prior Supreme Court litigation involving selective prosecution. The most recent was the Waite case involving uh, uh, prosecution for avoiding the draft. Uh, the claim was that you picked me out because I've been so vocal in opposing the draft and therefore you're burdening my First Amendment expression rights. And the government's reply was to admit that the 
the uh, very public nature of Waite's opposition was relevant to them, but they said, we're not doing it because of your First Amendment exercise, but despite it. Uh, that is, we picked you out just because you are so easy to identify. You've made our case, case easy, and we can go forward on that basis, but it's not because we want to punish First Amendment uh, exercise. As for our sin, we had an ordinance pro prohibiting gaming tables or gambling tables in San Francisco, uh, and the court said that the claim there was not established because there was no showing of a failure to enforce the uh, gambling uh, ordinance against whites. On the other hand, remember, Asin was a trial court ruling, not a discovery ruling. It said at the end of the day, your, your proof at trial didn't establish this and therefore it wasn't enough. So you might very well have distinguished Asin saying you need to have some lower standard for uh, discovery. And as for Yik Wo, well that was one of the few successful selective prosecution cases. We have uh, in the picture here a uh, uh, the uh, the laundry that was involved, the wooden laundry building involved in Yikwo, city ordinance or county ordinance says you can't put laundries in wooden buildings, risk of fire and so forth, but it was enforced only against the Chinese and the proof at trial did indeed show failure to enforce against other laundries, against non-Chinese laundry owners. Uh, and so the court said that was a successful uh, demonstration at trial, but again doesn't really get at the question of whether the uh, uh, the discovery standard should be lower, more forgiving uh, than the, uh, the trial standard. So where does this uh, case leave us going forward in terms of judicial monitoring and enforcement of claims of unconstitutional discrimination in the selection of uh, defendants, that is, selective prosecution? Well, some people who read Armstrong say this wipes these claims out entirely. It's impossible. And it is true that it's a very high standard to meet, but impossible may be a little too strong an evaluation. So think about it this way. If you were going to bring one of these claims, where would you get your evidence? Well, if you're in federal court, one thing you might do is go to the clerk in the state courts and see if you can put together something that's not just anecdotal, not selective, but do some kind of systematic study of the state court records. You might construct it at the clerk's office. You might construct it based on the state public defender's office records. And you may be able to find through some sampling of the cases uh, a number of non-blacks who were similarly situated to the black defendants in criminal court uh, and find that those non-black uh, defendants were convicted in state court of the, uh, of the same crime. Uh, or you might look to arrest records. Uh, they may be available at the courthouse. This is going to be trickier depending on state records law and whether it's publicly available, publicly searchable. This is more of a long shot, at least under, uh, under current law. Think through all of this, how many hours is this going to take? Probably not going to be something pursued by a single uh, defense attorney. It's probably going to be some kind of collective effort by a group of public defenders or other affiliated uh, attorneys. It's certainly not something that you commonly uh, run into. Now it may be that, the, uh, that this difficulty, this high hurdle that you have to meet under Armstrong gets a little lower or a little more reachable over time as information technology uh, becomes more widespread in the, uh, the criminal courts. Uh, and so you can start collecting records across cases and searching for cases and so forth. Uh, it may be that the Armstrong standard starts to come within reach for more ordinary litigants over time as that information technology landscape uh, changes. We'll have to just wait and see on that. Uh, and finally, also stop and think about how your arguments change as you move out of the courts and into other, uh, other uh, institutions. So what happens if you go to the prosecutor's office and ask for voluntary disclosure of declinations? Why would they ever say yes? Well, possibly, you know, if the political landscape is, uh, is favorable, it might be a good public relations community engagement kind of, of move for a prosecutor to post online or elsewhere uh, information about, uh, about patterns of cases and which cases were declined. 
You also could imagine going to a legislature and asking for a requirement of reports from prosecutors, particularly in a world where police departments have been required to report on their activities for some, for some time, so you could draw an analogy. But think about the kinds of arguments and evidence that you would bring into those settings that might be different from the uh, proof that would be required to establish this claim as a matter of constitutional law judicially enforceable. So that's our topic, selective prosecution. On we go.